This is the top 10 uses for stream monitoring and the unexpected pitfalls that keep your data from being used. I'm Dan Haug with Prairie Rivers of Iowa, a nonprofit in Ames. Uh, we have been on a journey with uh, eight partners in Story County over the past few years trying to make sense of water quality monitoring. It uh, seems easy <laughs> at first, you know, just dip a test, test strip. Turns out it's a lot more complicated, uh, a little bewildering. In fact, I think that we are coming out now on the other side a little wiser. So here you are, the top 10 uses for water quality monitoring. Uh, number one is to cultivate watershed leaders. We've been fortunate enough in the Ames area to have a lot of dedicated volunteers who've been doing this for 10, sometimes 20 years. And if you're out you know, in the stream on a regular basis, you get to be a, a, an informed advocate for that stream. And these folks have uh, also become leaders in promoting water trails and conservation. Um, so even regardless of the data used, just having people out there and, and they're, seeing, they're seeing what's happening in the stream. Um, for uh, elected officials that have already been tasked with, with addressing water quality and flooding, it can be really helpful to have some hands-on uh, water testing. So we uh, have, uh, it was Gene Eels uh, with Hamilton County Swim Water who started the practice of bringing in water samples and having everyone uh, test them for nitrate at our uh, Iowa Creek Watershed Management Authority meetings. It's a great way uh, to get a, a little bit of a feel for what the water quality issues actually are. Um, some of the pitfalls are, you know, making sure uh, is the data actually being used because volunteers will wonder, is their time being, being well spent? And people get burned out, they get uh, older and less able to climb around on, on uh, muddy banks. Um, and so we have to ask, how are we reaching new audiences and training new volunteers? So that brings us to use number two for water monitoring is to engage young people. And I've been fortunate enough to work with high school students and younger uh, on water testing projects. Um, I think a really good entry point uh, for young people is uh, the, the bugs, uh, the benthic macroinvertebrates. So here are some damselfly larvae. Here's some students testing at, at Kegley Branch near Gilbert. Um, and, you know, interesting critters are very memorable. And it's not just the benthic uh, macroinvertebrates, the, uh, the water bugs that we're testing for. Uh, when, when you're out there with a net, you're also going to uh, catch some other things, what we might call terrestrial uh, macrovertebrates. So here's a northern water snake uh, and people catch frogs and all kinds of things. Uh, so very memorable experience, especially if for, for kids who have not had a lot of experience with the outdoors. Um, if you can't bring the kids to the stream, you can bring the stream to the kids. So here we have it um, at an event a, a tub uh, of critters that we caught in the South Skunk River and here's an interesting looking crayfish and of course a big draw for for the kids to, to see that. Um, the water the water quality part of it is a little bit trickier you get into some math and some chemistry but I found that even with very young kids uh, first of all they enjoy uh, the experience of, of pulling water up with a, a milk jug on a rope even that's a lot of fun um, and even very young kids, uh, kindergarten, first grade, I found, understand the idea, okay, this water is clear, this is, is muddy, we can keep the, the soil from getting washed into the stream by having plants growing in it, right? They, they all get that. And I found that, uh, like my little daughter, when she was in first grade, she remembered what she measured with the transparency tube because she was doing science for the first time. So it um, can be a very memorable experience. There, uh, th Some of the challenges is that we often have competing goals, right? As a uh, a project coordinator, you, you're wanting to get data, and so you're looking for, for labor to help with, help you, but you know you also want to make sure that the students are having a memorable and fun experience. Um, sometimes uh, there's a trade-off between data that's that's useful for the end user and, and data that is tractable uh, for for students who are kind of working with this for the first time, making sure that that it's it's easy enough to, to understand and work with. Um, and then we have some trade-offs between, you know, wanting to get kids in the stream so they're exposed to nature and they appreciate it, and then also are they being exposed to hazards like pathogens. So that brings us to use number three for water quality data, shock your friends. Um, so as an example, here are uh, the Skunk River paddlers enjoying a, a quick run down Iowa Creek uh, after, uh, after a rainfall. Um, and uh, I happened to be out uh, and collected a sample, took it to the lab on that same day. We found that E. coli bacteria, an indicator of fecal contamination, was 10 times the primary contact recreation standard. So a little bit shocking. Um, we have found that fecal contamination in central Iowa streams is, is uh, frequent and it is widespread. Uh, so here is data from 15 sites that, that we tested uh, last year in Story County. And all of those exceeded the primary contact 
standard, at least one of the months that we tested, uh, two of them exceeded the secondary contact standard. And then overall, um, I think nine out of 10 uh, exceeded the, the standard for the recreational season. So this is, is an issue. Uh, I'd say, um, you know, still in, enjoy, enjoy Iowa waters, but, but uh, use a little caution, pack some hand sanitizer. Um, and the pitfall with this is, you know, sure, this is this is a wake up call for folks, but people are going to ask, uh, you know, where is the poop coming from? How do we fix it? And often we don't have a good answer to that. One thing we can do with E. coli data is uh, um, show it to the Iowa DNR and have them go through the process. And um, so use number four for the uh, for water quality data is add, add uh, streams and lakes to the impaired waters list. And here we have an example, Montgomery Creek, a tributary to Iowa Creek in Boone County, um, that was added to the impaired waters list, uh, partially supporting it for recreation because of high bacteria levels. And uh, the reason for that, this, the source of the data was volunteer monitoring, that there was an agreement with, with DNR, you can get samples to a certified lab under a quality assurance plan, and that data was was used for this listing decision. Um, and that's pretty rare. Um, there's also some little, in this, uh, there are some uh, little uh, caveats and addendas that uh, we have become familiar with. So the uh, here, presumptive uh, recreational and, and game fish use. Uh, in actuality, this creek does not have enough uh, water most of the time to float a canoe or go swimming or <laughs> catch, a, um, catch a bass, um, but often, you know, with the smaller creeks, um, DNR doesn't have the, the, the need or the resources to go out and, and do that determination. And then there's this TMDL priority, which is, um, you know, there's a waiting list to develop a cleanup plan and often creeks with a, little creeks with a bacteria impairment are at the bottom of that list. Um, much more often we are finding is that streams have never been assessed, even if there has been a long-term volunteer monitoring, uh, DNR has not um, been able to make use of that data. Uh, that was the case with uh, Squaw Creek, now known as Iowa Creek um, in uh, Boone, uh, Story, and Hamilton counties. Um, so we have uh, since provided some of our data, um, bi-weekly uh, lab testing uh, to the DNR and was able to um, uh, make note of that on the, uh, on the assessment database. Um, but again, there's some fine print here. Um, so yeah, here's our special projects uh, being, uh, being used as the data source. But the fine print here is that this is not actually on the impaired waters list. This is on the waters in need of further investigation list. So um, the issue here is that uh, there is a credible data law um, in Iowa that really limits the DNR's use of, of data that they don't collect or that their designees don't collect. Um, and they have to have a, a approved a quality assurance plan and lately they've not been um, able or willing to approve quality assurance plans. Um, and then of course the issue of, of once, once it's on the list, um, how soon can you get a cleanup plan developed and is that uh, cleanup plan feasible. Often there's a lot of big changes that are needed and we don't have the funding or the, the uh, regulatory authority to, uh, to do anything about it. So if that's the case, uh, then we come to use number five for volunteer uh, data. Find and fix problems. Can we do it ourselves locally? And in some cases we can. So here's Irv Kloss, a longtime uh, volunteer in the, the Ames area, been uh, testing, he had uh, been testing Iowa Creek at, at South Delta Avenue for uh, regularly for, for several years. And at one point found that, um, that his little petri dish uh, of testing for E. coli, the media did not gel. There was something weird going on. Tested it again, uh, presented the results to uh, City of Ames staff, to Iowa DNR. Uh, they did some follow up and found that there was a, a crack in a sanitary sewer main. So was able to get that that fixed because of the data that he was collecting. Um, that's uh, you know this is one of the things that we hope for with volunteer monitoring. It's it's not it doesn't happen very often because it requires regular monitoring to catch these kinds of things. And it's easy to, to miss things like a, um, you know, a manure spill or a, a chemical spill or a water main break or something that happens uh, um, briefly and, and maybe um, it also requires uh, diplomacy because often um, to get these things fixed, um, you, you're going to need the help of people and you want to be sure to, um, to uh, bring up the issue in a way that's not going to alienate the, those folks. Use number six for water quality monitoring is to grade streams. Um, the Isaac Walton League's uh, Clean Water Hub 
is very good for this. They have a color-coded system so that you know, well, I got five milligrams per liter of nitrate. Is that a good, uh, bad, fair, poor? And in this case, um, color-coded that as, as good. Um, so this can be really helpful to get a sense for, for what's um, what's normal, what's good, what's bad in, in a stream. Um, same kind of thing with the critters, the benthic macroinvertebrates. We can divide those into sensitive and less sensitive groups and come up with a, a ranking um, based on that. Is the stream in good, fair, poor condition? And so if you're seeing a lot of the sensitive critters, the uh, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, um, that's a sign that the stream is in good condition. If you're mostly seeing the black flies, the leeches, the, the, the uh, um, midge flies then, uh, that are very tolerant of pollution, then that's a sign that the stream's in poor condition. Um, some of the pitfalls with this is that um, those, those color codes can be a little misleading if we're not just talking about what's happening in the stream, but what's happening downstream. Um, and that can be a function of not just of, of the uh, concentration of, of nutrients in the stream, but the amount of water uh, washing those nutrients downstream. So it turns out that we can be shipping a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus down to the Gulf of Mexico on days when it looks like it's a, a good water quality day. So that can be a little tricky. Um, use number seven for uh, water quality monitoring is to diagnose poor stream health. So if you have found, you know, mostly uh, leeches and, and black flies uh, in your water body and and you know, gotten a poor index. So we want to know well, why is that. And there's a lot of reasons that uh, critters can be having a hard time in the stream. It might be that it's too salty. Uh, we can test for that with chloride. It might be that it is too hot. We can test for that with water temperature. Often, um, if there is uh, effluent or runoff from for parking lots that can warm up the water outside the range that that critters like. Um, we can do habitat surveys to find out, you know, is there places for them to hide and things for them to eat. Um, we can test the transparency and that tells us, you know, is it silty enough that it's covering up the rocks where critters live or making it hard for them to find food and mates. Um, some of the pitfalls, uh, there are other things that affect aquatic life that volunteers typically don't test. Um, so here's uh, a little scorecard from the U.S. Geologic Surveys, Midwest stream quality assessment, a very detailed study of streams in the Midwest and the factors that influence fish and, uh, and insects. And some of those are uh, total nitrogen and total phosphorus. Um, all forms of those uh, matter for, for aquatic life. Um, the dissolved forms that we typically measure, nitrate and, and orthophosphate, a uh, little not as good an indicator. Um, pesticides in, in the water or in the sediment um, turned out to be a really good predictor. Uh, bifenthrin is a common pyrethroid pesticide that shows up a lot in, uh, in the stream bottom in the Midwest. Um, so uh, sometimes we may be missing some other factors that are, that are explaining that. Use number eight for water quality monitoring. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have some very dedicated volunteers who are testing streams for uh, 10 times a year or more uh, for five or more years. So here's you know, a, a little sense of, of some of the long-term monitoring that was happening in the Iowa Creek, uh, Creek watershed. And if you're doing that, then you can get charts like this one that shows the trends over time. Here in Montgomery Creek, we had a decline in nitrate uh, from 2002 to 2009, and then a spike in, in 2013. And that can be explained partly by weather. We had a, a drought followed by a wet spring, and that washed away a lot of the nitrogen that the crops weren't able to take up and that the rain hadn't washed out previously. The challenge with measuring trends is that water quality can be so variable. So if you have a subtle trend, like we see here in the phosphorus in the South Skunk River uh, the past, um, past seven years, uh, and you know, highly variable, you can get different results depending on whether you're going out on the first week of the month, the second week of the month, the third week of the month. Um, so uh, we can use statistics to help us tease out, is this, is this a fluke or is it a real trend? So here's with the, the confidence intervals are telling us that no, these are not statistically significant trends. We should take those with a grain of salt. Um, However, it is possible to find trends. So here are um, some uh, out of the six sites that were monitored for uh, on a regular basis for, for seven years in the Iowa Creek watershed. Three of those did find uh, statistically significant trends. So if it's, it's, if it's a big enough trend, we can spot those.
Use number nine for water quality monitoring. As I've said, there's a lot of variation uh, from week to week. These videos will help explain that. Here is uh, a tributary of Iowa Creek uh, below Ames High School um, under normal conditions. Um, however, it gets, uh, it receives water from a storm sewer system. So here is after a heavy rain. And now you can understand why we get these uh, steep eroded cut banks, why we get muddy water. Quite a dramatic change. And so the results of that shows up in our water testing. Here's a good example. We had uh, um, one year during our volunteer event, we uh, Clear Creek was true to its name. We had found um, transparency levels as clear as you could get. You can look down into the Secchi tube from, from the very top, fill it all the way up, and, and it shows up at the bottom. Um, very low phosphate levels. Tested it a week later after a, after a heavy rainfall, and now the water is as muddy as you could possibly get. Uh, you can only <laughs> see the, the disc when you get it down to one centimeter of water. Um, orthophosphate was very high. Um, so water quality can change dramatically. Um, once, once you're aware of that, you can, um, you can be on, on the lookout for ways to, uh, to get da data during those critical periods, and there are some tools that can help with that. Um, here's a, a, a graph from a nitrate sensor installed by um, University of Iowa, uh, IIHR, Hydroscience and Engineering. They have a fleet of nitrate sensors around the state. Uh, you can find those on the Iowa Water Quality Information System. And so here we found uh, just this, this uh, this spring, um, at the time that our volunteers were out collecting data, um, the water levels were low after a long period of drought, it had very low nitrate levels, three milligrams per liter. A week later, had a heavy rainfall, um, water levels rose and nitrate rose with it because now all the, the drainage tiles are flowing up to 16 milligrams per liter of nitrate. So this can be really interesting to get an idea of, of how, how pollutants are moving and when that's happening. Uh, another tool, uh, those are very expensive sensors. So another tool I've been, been testing out is these Nalgene storm samplers. Um, if you don't wanna be running out in the middle of a thunderstorm to get a water sample, you can, um, can set out one of these when, uh, um, and when the water level rises above the, the intake, it fills up, the little ball rises and, and seals it shut. And so you can get a sample from during the storm. Um, and here are some of the samples I got during a storm recently. Uh, you can see that coffee colored one is uh, from the South Skunk River. We had uh, some <laughs> dramatic, uh, dramatic erosion happening. And again, that one went from very clear to very dirty in a short period of time. Also saw high nitrite levels, which I don't usually see. Um, so it can be tricky to capture pollutants, you know, do the testing during those important periods. For chloride, uh, that's often in the winter when road salt application is happening. Often people don't want to be going out and drilling a hole in the ice in, in the winter, uh, understandably. Um, it can be tricky to get out there during a storm event to test for phosphorus and, and uh, sediment. But again, there are some tools that we can use. Um, another thing, you know, we want to make sure that's not an excuse. You know, it's, it's not the weather's fault. It's, it does have something to do with the things that we are doing on our farms and, and in town. And so good land stewardship uh, still matters. We want to keep that message front and center. Um, use number 10, once you, once you know uh, kind of when pollutant pollution is happening, then the, the value of volunteer snapshot events becomes really clear. Having a bunch of people testing a bunch of streams on the same day or the same weekend. So here's uh, a volunteer snapshot event um, in the Iowa Creek watershed that we had uh, this May. And the results of that, you can produce maps that shows where are the um, where are things better? Where are things worse? You can do uh, rankings. So here we have uh, phosphorus from, from multiple years of data and can see which streams are, are better or worse than, than the, the main stem of Iowa Creek. So Clear Creek is better. Gilbert Creek is much, much worse. The reason for that turns out to be um, discharge from a, a wastewater treatment plant. Um, very few uh, wastewater treatment plants are just now starting to uh, install technology that can remove nitrogen and phosphorus. And so that's the, the reason for this one. Um, some of the challenges with this is if you have a, a you know, a big spreadsheet of, of volunteer data, sometimes some sites were sampled only in a wet year, some were only in a dry year. So you need to account for that or you will get some misleading results. Um, and then the other challenge is 
you know, once we've identified, you know, where are some of the hotspots where we might want to focus our efforts, where we can get more, uh, more impact from our conservation dollar, um, are those actually being used by the, the agencies that are making the funding decisions and the field staff that are working with farmers? Um, so uh, closing thoughts, you know, we're really committed to helping Iowans learn more and do more with the data that citizen scientists collect. We've been um, working with, with eight partners in Story County to develop this uh, water monitoring and interpretation plan. And I think that we've learned some lessons that we are going to be excited to, uh, to uh, apply more broadly in Iowa. So hopefully we can, uh, can help you get more use out of your data locally. Um, I'm Dan Howe with Prairie Rivers of Iowa. Thanks for joining me.